Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Gonna go to a channel that I've never done a reaction to before, but is one that I know that a lot of you are familiar with and watch regularly. My little details tell me such things. Uh, this is Legal Eagle. I've seen a few of his videos not related to history, uh, so I have a little bit of an understanding of typically what he does. I think he does a fantastic job communicating on it. This one's incredible. These things used to be illegal in America. So I thought it would fit well with the theme of history on our channel and give us a different look at some of the forgotten parts of history, uh, including things that we probably take for granted are a part of everyday life and would never think have a problem <laughs> for most people, but once were considered bad enough to be banned. So we're going to take a look at that today. The link is in the description to the original content. If you want to check it out without my commentary, I want to give a shout out to my friend Ryan in Menor, Ohio. Ryan, I didn't, I don't know how I didn't realize that you were one of our patrons, but thank you, Ryan. Uh, and hopefully I'll see you again real soon. Uh, we can get lunch again or something sometime. Let's go ahead and dive into this one. And as we dive into this, I want to give you guys a heads up that if you are a patron or a member, this is your last chance to vote on the new reaction series. We're going to be starting that in the next day or two. Uh, so go ahead and head over there right now. Or if you want to sign up and join, this is a great time to do that. And you can cast your vote on what the next reaction series will be. All right, here we go. America is the freest country in the world. Just ask anyone who's never been outside of the country. But it wasn't always this way. What if I told you that the U.S. used to make all kinds of wacky things illegal? The great con man Harold Hill once convinced a town to allow a boy's brass band so kids didn't fall victim to dangerous crimes like gambling, smoking, or reading Balzac. Balzac. But what else did America want? That's the Music Man, I believe, is the reference there. Uh, Hugh Jackman starred in the Music, music Man on Broadway. This band. Now, Americans have always been suspicious of dancing, and we have the Puritans to thank for it. Way back in 1684, an OG Boston school named Increase Mather published an anti-dancing pamphlet called An Arrow Against Profane and Promiscuous Dancing, which argues that dancing, quote, drowns out the quiver of the scriptures. Thankfully, Americans excel at finding ways to get around oppressive laws. In the 1830s, people organized play parties, no, not that kind of play party, where they played children's games, allowing them to chant and clap uh, as a way to avoid bans on dancing. And these parties persisted until the 1950s. Laws banning dancing almost always started at the city level. Uh, see Elmore City, Oklahoma, which made dancing strictly illegal in 1898. That law stood for almost 90 years until a group of high school students wanted to overturn the ban and have a real senior prom with dancing. This so if you thought that the premise for the movie Footloose was completely fictional, there you go. Students faced opposition from the city's religious leaders like this guy. Uh, the beat of music, the curves of the body, the uh, display of the outward person, we don't believe is congruent with the principles of Bible doctrine, especially. Well, if it's not congruent with the Bible doctrine, don't do it. You don't have to make a law to ban everybody else from doing it. Um, so <clears throat> here's the deal with this. Uh, and I know that... First of all, I want to get this guy's face students... off before I continue talking because he creeps me out a little bit. Um, this is a complicated thing, and I, and I understand all of the arguments that are going to go into this because we're going to talk about religion and how it crosses over into politics and vice versa and the separation of church and state argument that people will make and all those sorts of things. Um, but the, the bottom line is that for a good bit of American history, things that today we don't think are a big deal were once a really big deal. Remember, it wasn't that long ago that they wouldn't show Elvis from the waist down on TV because he, the way he shook his hips. Uh, there was an episode of the Ed Sullivan show where Buddy Holly went on and Ed Sullivan wanted him to change the line to his song, Oh Boy. Uh, there's a verse that says, all of my life I've been awaiting, tonight there will be no hesitating, oh boy. Uh, and Ed Sullivan thought that was too racy to be on his show, and they argued about it, Buddy Holly wouldn't change it, and so right before Buddy Holly goes on, Ed Sullivan turns down the sound on his amp. And so if you watch the live performance, which there's videos of, you can't hear his guitar. Uh, and you can kind of see Buddy Holly's just kind of playing really irritated, and that has to do with what went on with all of that. Uh, so... 
the standards of morality have changed for society. Uh, and there are always going to be people who fight against that. And whether you agree with those standards of morality or not, they definitely have radically changed. It's held bake sales and fundraisers for their prom. They taught each other to dance. And eventually the city council repealed the law by a margin of three votes to two. Lisa Rawlings was a sophomore at Elmore City High at the time. Her dad, the mayor, helped change the rule. She says a new boy in town pictured here got the ball rolling. So I think Leonard's probably the one who, who asked the question just because he was an outer towner. Now Leonard's real name was not Kevin Bacon, but when People Magazine covered Elmore City's Police. prom, it got the attention of of screenwriter Dean Pitchford, who went on to write the screenplay for Footloose. Today, Elmore City hosts an annual Footloose festival where, as you can imagine, everyone cuts Footloose. And that is such a fun song. It's 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 one of those like road trip songs that you can listen to and just really jam to as you go. But yeah, um, yeah. Sometimes the craziest stories that we see in movies have some basis in reality. Uh, where there's smoke, there's fire, and, and where these stories were born, it often came out of some screenwriter, some author, some random person's personal experience. Now, even after Footloose, small town dancing bands still stuck around in many parts of the country. The Supreme Court held that social dancing is generally not covered by the First Amendment, whereas partially nude dancing is expressive enough to be worthy of First Amendment protection. Like, why, why, why is there a Whereas Alexander Hamilton with his thumbs up. expressive enough to be worthy of... For <laughs> we got Hamilton in Washington like, yeah. Um, that's interesting. First Amendment protection. That gave towns cover to regulate social dances, and so dancing was effectively banned in places like Pound, Virginia, until well into the 21st century. Now, Pound's anti-dancing ordinance to Pound, dancing Virginia. in any place... I have ancestors buried in Pound, Virginia. I think my bowling family is from there. The public that did not first obtain a dance hall permit from the city council. The council was not allowed to issue a permit, quote, to a person who is not a person of good moral character. Interesting. And the council was also required to consider the proximity of a proposed dance hall to residential areas, churches, or schools. And you can probably guess what the cutaway is going to be right here. <laughs> Well, obviously someone did think of the children because the prohibition on dancing had a chilling effect on its citizens' desires to do the twist. No one even tried to apply for a permit until William Elam, the owner of the Golden Pine Restaurant, applied for a permit to host uh, country line dancing. But Elam withdrew the petition after 200 pitchfork-wielding townspeople showed up at a city council meeting to oppose the application. But Elam sued the city and won. Wow. The town argued that it had a legitimate state interest in stopping people from drinking too much. The court agreed that this was a legitimate concern, the ordinance was so broad that it applied even to places where alcohol wasn't consumed. For so th this is a great point to say that there is still, uh, again, this guy's bulge is bothering me. I'm going to go back. <laughs> um, there is a great deal of leeway that communities have in being able to regulate certain things. So, for example, where I live, uh, it's legal to have a strip club, but you can't have the strippers get completely nude if you're serving alcohol. Uh, and, and I know it's a lot more complicated that, and, and that's basically how it goes. And I've never been in a strip club, so don't go thinking that I know this stuff from personal experience. I've never been to one in my life. Um, but uh, there are a lot of those kinds of regulations that communities can have. And, and there are lots of dry communities around the country where alcohol is just not even allowed to be served or... Um, you know, in our community, if you have a winery, for example, you can only serve wine that you produced yourself and all of those sorts of regulations and rules and stuff like that. And uh, of course, if things rise all the way to the Supreme Court, they might get ruled on and then therefore affect the entire country. Uh, but by and large, there's a lot of variety from one community to the next, one county, one state to the next in terms of what's legal and what's not. Concern, the ordinance was so broad that it applied even to places where alcohol wasn't consumed. For example, a for-profit performance of the Nutcracker Ballet would require prior approval from the town council, even if it were performed in a place that did not commonly serve or sell alcohol. The court ruled that the terms dancing, moral character, and proper person were unconstitutionally vague and overbroad mm. because the Pound Town Council 
yeah, the, the pound town, council, town. Uh, had the sole discretion to bar public performances of dances, social or otherwise, quote, merely by declaring that the sponsor of such a dance was an improper person or one who lacked good moral character. And despite this ruling, the city was undaunted by this setback and enacted a new dancing ban. So I can see how that would be an issue because then it's very subjective. And if you have an issue with somebody because you you know, they bullied you in high school, you might say they're bad moral character and then reject them. So it's probably going to be legal to just ban it outright. But when you put those kind of qualifications on it, then you get into kind of constitutionally vague areas. Elam continued hosting dirty dances at his club and state authorities revoked the Golden Pine restaurant's license to sell alcohol. And although the Golden Pine eventually closed, the police department didn't last much longer than the restaurant. It was disbanded in 2021 because its officers mishandled so much evidence that prosecutors had to drop 31 criminal cases. In fact, the town spent so much time and money stopping its citizens from doing the tango that it forgot how to be an actual town. In 2022, the Virginia legislature revoked the town's charter after repeated failures to do basic things like pass a budget or maintain a wastewater plant. But if you thought that this stopped lawmakers in Western Virginia from regulating dancing, well, think again. Uh, Wise County stepped up to make sure that the citizens of Pound and other citizens in the county did not fall prey to the vicissitudes of the cha-cha or the waltz. Today, Wise County regulates public dance halls and the cops have the right to enter at any time to make sure the patrons are, quote, conducting themselves in a peaceable and orderly fashion. Wise Don't County's get too wild with your dances. Ordinance repeats the same, quote, proper person language that the federal court found to be problematic. But on the upside, we'll probably get a sequel to Footloose sometime soon. Now, dancing Put loose kind of to pound town. And again, these, these laws, many of them will stay on the books until somebody challenges them. Uh, many times, common practices that have existed for a long, long time, as long as nobody who is affected by it makes a big deal about it, there's nothing that's going to happen. A perfect example of this, the high school that I attended I graduated in high school from high school in 1995. Every morning, we did the Lord's Prayer on the uh, morning announcements. Now, to most people in America and probably the world, that sounds crazy that a public high school would have a student doing the Lord's Prayer over the loudspeaker. But nobody thought it was weird. That was just what we had always done. Most people were fine with it. And I think it's only been in like the last 10 years or so that finally there was a student's family who made an issue of it, and they stopped doing it. It makes sense when you think about it, but did you know that pinball is considered the devil's balls? Well, when the Supreme Court struck down a federal ban on sports betting in 2018, states were eager to legalize gambling. 36 states and the District of Columbia now allow you to lose your shirt betting on the ponies, or, you know, the commanders, as the case may be. But America was not always so bullish on gambling. In the yeah. 1920s, moral scolds targeted coin-operated gambling machines like pinball. Now, no one loved to demonize pinball more than New York Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia. The man yeah, whose the name airport's is now named emblazoned yep. on one of America's worst airports wasn't shocked. He's absolutely right when he says one of America's worst airports. Although the last time I was at LaGuardia, which was a couple months ago, it was better. I feel like it's improved a lot since the first time I flew in there, which was probably 10, 15 years ago. Shy about preaching pinball's links to juvenile delinquency. And World War II gave him a new talking point. Pinball was anti-American. After the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, uh, Mayor LaGuardia said it was infinitely preferable that the metal in these evil contraptions be manufactured into arms and bullets, which can be used to destroy our foreign enemies. There's not that much metal, and he though. And pinball, and New York City police conducted raids on the city's candy shops and amusement parks. Now, mayors in Washington, D.C., New Orleans, Milwaukee, and Chicago followed LaGuardia's lead, and campaign photographs of the era show wow. lawmakers and lawmen posing with the hammers they used to smash up. Man, this this feels so much like Prohibition, where you have the the images of them smashing barrels of liquor pinball really i i don't agree with the dancing band but i at least kind of understand that but pinball the pinball machines uh, here's a newsreel showing the police proudly removing these dangerous objects after they were outlawed new york city completes a roundup of thousands of pinball machines each valued at about a hundred dollars 
No more of this in Manhattan. And the politics of pinball lasted well into the 1960s. Uh, Republicans thought they had JFK's number when they found a photo of him standing next to a man who was a silent partner in an Indiana pinball joint. Later, Kennedy's brother Bobby waged war on interstate pinball gambling. And to bring it full circle, attorney Jim Garrison, who tried to solve JFK's assassination, was indicted in 1971 for accepting bribes from a mafia kingpin who wanted him to protect pinball gambling. So I guess it's the gambling part that is the sticking point here. If it was a an object that was being used heavily for gambling and therefore probably had mob involvement and 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 other kind of seedy elements, then I, I guess I can understand why they would target those things. Um, but otherwise, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, and you thought you lived in the dumbest timeline. But of course, the demonization of pinball made the game cool, and that's why so many movies and TV shows set in the 50s and 60s show their leather jacket wearing rebels playing pinball. Uh. But California finally put an end to this pinball madness when the state Supreme Court found that pinball was a game of skill in 1974. When the Los Angeles banned pinball in 1938, pinball players didn't have many ways to impact their score, other than by jostling the machine to manipulate the ball. But in 1947, flippers were invented, giving players more control over what happened uh, to the ball after. So now it's not an issue of being a game of chance where you, it's just really completely random whether or not you can win. There's skill involved. And, and a lot of the gambling that has been made legal in places is under that guise of it has to be a game where you your skill level can directly impact whether or not you're able to win. Uh, and then here in Ohio, I know, for example, for a long time, casino gambling was completely illegal in Ohio. And in Ohio, we have the ability to put something directly on the ballot as a constitutional amendment, which we just did in Ohio with abortion, uh, making abortion legal in Ohio uh, through a constitutional amendment. And um, over and over and over again, this was on the ballot to create a certain number of legal casinos in Ohio. Uh, and it took several times before it finally passed. And actually, one of the four or five that were built under that first constitutional amendment is right in the town that uh, where my kids go to school. Where it was launched. And a group of business owners sued LA, alleging that the addition of flippers changed pinball into a game of skill that couldn't be regulated by the city. Uh, the trial court agreed, and the California Supreme Court affirmed holding that the city's law was preempted by state regulation of games of skill. The court also suggested that treating games of chance differently than games of skill could violate the Equal Protection Clause. Huh. But the anti-pinball crusaders have not completely disappeared, though. Uh, in South Carolina, you can walk down any street openly carrying a handgun, but it's still illegal for minors to play pinball. Uh, the legislature is now, in 2023, gearing up for a big debate on whether to... I don't... I don't know why he found it necessary to talk about the gun law. I mean, I understand what he's trying to get at, that in his mind it seems ridiculous you can do this but not this, but a minor can't walk around you know, carrying a handgun, nor can they play pinball. I agree pinball shouldn't be illegal for minors, but it's just a weird thing to bring up there. You repeal the pinball ban. Uh, gosh, really tackling the, the most important uh, and potentially dangerous issues there in that election cycle. Now, one of Johnny Carson's most popular bits was the great Karnak. Sis boom ba. Sis boom ba. This was always really funny. I remember these. Describe the sound made when a sheep explodes. But fortune telling is not always a laughing matter. The Supreme Court has said that, quote, the First Amendment does not shield fraud. And in the old days, fortune telling was regarded as an inherently fraudulent occupation. Yeah, so basically what the Supreme Court's saying is if you're dumb enough to get defrauded by someone in a situation like that, that's on you. Interesting that was so deceptive that it could not qualify as free speech. The fortune tellers probably should have seen that one coming. And there are dozens of court cases confirming this view. For example, in 1928, the city of Cleveland charged Gertrude Davis with having violated section 13145 of the general code, prohibiting and penalizing fortune telling. Now, I don't know where this is going to go, but they still exist, obviously. They're they're not advertised. Like, I, I can remember being younger and being, like, seeing the 1-800 or one nine hundred or whatever numbers they were for like the psychic hotline, and I think it was Dion Warwick was like the spokesperson for it. And uh, I guess the way you get around that is you have to probably disclaim that it's for entertainment purposes only, and then it's probably legal. 
The state law barred fortune telling without a license, but neither the city or the state actually provided a way for anyone to get that license. And the Ohio Supreme Court did not care about this particular catch-22, surmising that the words about licensing were just surplusage that could be read out of the statute. Uh, Davis argued that fortune telling was a legitimate business that wasn't penalized at common law, but as the court explained, the opposite was true. Uh, so this is... Uh this whole idea of fortune telling for profit is nothing new. There's a story in the book of Acts in the Bible about uh, the apostle Paul casting demons out of a fortune teller. I'm not implying that everybody who does fortune telling is demon possessed. I'm just saying that this was the instance. Uh, and after that, she wasn't able to, uh, to tell fortunes anymore and her owner because she was a slave girl got really upset because he lost this source of revenue because he had done Paul had done this and and kind of turned a mob on Paul so this is 2000 years ago people were making money from fortune telling in the UK, palmistry, astrology, and fortune telling were crimes, and the same was true in the Canadian and American colonies. Uh, people who practiced uh, occult trades were not allowed to run legitimate businesses, despite the fact that kings and queens and Nancy Reagan consulted astrologists and fortune tellers for. Not only Nancy Reagan, uh, this was something that Mary Todd Lincoln did as well. There were times that Abraham Lincoln would come back home to find his wife doing a seance and consulting a medium trying to talk, contact her dead sons, Willie and Eddie. Vice. Honestly, they probably should have seen that one coming too. Are there any psychics in this town? But the Ohio court rejected Davis's free speech claim on the grounds that the state had the power to regulate speech for the protection of the public health, safety, welfare, and morals. Uh, these are known as the state's police powers. And although Davis argued that the law infringed on her freedom of religion, the court disagreed comparing fortune telling to polygamy. However, for decades, fortune tellers have argued- And by comparing it to polygamy, polygamy what he means is the, the Mormon church, uh, which for a long time allowed polygamy, doesn't anymore. Um, would try to argue that <clears throat> that states' bans on polygamy were an infringement on religion, and and they're citing that as an example of saying, well, no, it's in the state's best interest that this remain illegal, even if your religion says it's okay. Argue that they really are engaged in legitimate business activity protected by the due process clause, and they say that the tales that they tell are protected by the First Amendment. And modern courts have started to legitimize fortune telling as a profession. For example, in 2010, a Maryland court struck down Montgomery County's ban on fortune telling. There, Nick Nefedro uh, wanted to open a fortune telling business in Bethesda, but his father and grandfather always warned him that Montgomery County was hostile to Romani people. So Nefedro sued the county. The Maryland Court of Appeals originally suggested that the county set up up a licensing system, quote, whereby a psychic would have to accurately predict, say, six out of 10 events in order to obtain a proper permit. But eventually, Maryland's top court ruled that the ordinance violated Nefedro's constitutional right to freedom of speech. Quote, we see nothing in the record to suggest that fortune telling always involves fraudulent statements. Indeed, fortune tellers like magicians or horoscope writers are able to provide entertainment to there their customers go. or some other benefit that does not deceive those who receive their speech. Yeah, and I figured that's kind of where that was going to go. Um, that that's how you legalize it, is you just call it entertainment. The cards come with things that you will never see by yourself. And the Maryland court rejected the county's assertion that the ordinance regulated conduct, not speech. As for the county's argument that the law protected people from fraud, the court said, quote, while we recognize that some fortune tellers may make fraudulent statements, uh, just as some lawyers or journalists may, we see nothing on the record to suggest that fortune telling always involves fraudulent mm. statements. I'm not exactly sure how I feel about the court analogizing lawyering to fortune telling, uh, but I guess when lawyers like Sidney L. Crichino Powell have become household names and the court might have a point. Uh, but now that fortune telling is legal, finally America's rich, lonely people will have someone to talk to. Uh, states can still use anti-fraud laws when a fortune teller crosses the line. When does a fortune teller cross the line? When they commit larceny and fraud in the course of a psychic reading. Believe it or not, not all fortune telling is automatically considered abject fraud. For example, in 2018, the NYPD arrested psychic Zoe on suspicion of defrauding clients out of over $800,000. Hmm. She allegedly lured one victim in with a $5 reading and then convinced her that, quote, she 
she'd never find love again unless she bought the psychic a 9.2 carat diamond ring. Yeah, same victim- that's that's not okay. Yeah, I get that. And gave Zoe over $700,000 for spells and protections against demons. But look, you can't argue with results. She hasn't been attacked by a single demon since she's gotten those protections. Do we know now, that, Zoe though? Zoe pleaded guilty to a scheme to defraud and was sentenced to probation and restitution. Yeah, that's fair. I guess she didn't see that one coming. Uh, yeah, it used to be illegal to sell or buy alcohol on election day. Now, you oh, might think that, that these laws that were passed sense. during prohibition, but they're actually rooted in a very different time period. From America's earliest days, alcohol was synonymous with voting. I can't vote without it. Uh, but the first Democratic body in... I may be in that situation in November. I may not be able to vote without being under the influence in this election the American colonies was the Virginia House of the Burgesses. And many of America's future leaders served in the House of Burgesses, including George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, and George Mason. And at the time, only white male landowners were allowed to vote, and they would line up at Williamsburg and state their preferences via voce. But it was customary for candidates to ply their voters with liquor during these events. And in fact, young George Washington tried to win a seat in the House when he was 24, but he was rebuffed after he decided against treating voters to booze. There were a lot of times, uh, if if you've ever seen the TV series uh, Hatfields and the McCoys, uh, they one of the major events that happens in the Hatfield and McCoy feud happens during this big festival that's happening as a part of Election Day. Uh, it was definitely like kind of a time for partying and celebrating and things like that. And, uh, you know, voting was done very differently even 100 years ago than it is today as far as how voting went, you know, people actually printed out ballots for their side and and you would get a Republican ticket and you would drop it in. Uh, that's why they use that term ticket um, and things were just done differently. And so a lot of times, like, for example, with I know there was the Supreme Court case that came out today uh, concerning Donald Trump and being on the ballot in Co Colorado and all of that. And people try to make the analogy uh, and the connection to Abraham Lincoln not getting any votes in the South in the 1860 presidential election. Well, that was not not a situation where, say, South Carolina banned Abraham Lincoln from being on the ballot because South Carolina didn't print ballots that people went in and checkmarked and turned in. What happened was when you went to vote, you had the ticket for the people you were voting for. And you dropped that in, and that was how you voted. And the Republicans just knew that Lincoln couldn't win in those states, so they didn't bother printing tickets uh, and distributing them to people to vote in those states. So it was really a situation of personal choice. Three years later, Washington ran again, but this time he showed up with 144 gallons of alcoholic drinks. Let's... <laughs> Drunk history. Let's do this. Now, unsurprisingly, the landowners came through for Washington in a landslide. Washington gave away half a gallon of liquor or wine for every vote that he won. That's 391 votes, to be precise. And Washington never forgot the power of booze. And according to popular myth, at the Battle of Trenton, he caught the Hessians off guard because they were so wasted. Well, wait, we need to no, fight. That is we're just we're a kind myth. of drunk and we're kind of up. And Washington eventually spent 7% of his White House budget on spirits. And this wasn't particularly... Complete minor quibble here. You can't call it the White House budget. There was no White House when Washington was president. The federal budget or the executive budget, maybe. Uncommon. In the 18th and 19th centuries, politicians realized that since many saloons were also polling places, they could win votes by throwing raging keggers when the landowning men arrived in town. And getting voters sauced became a key strategy for getting out the vote on election day. It was known as, quote, swilling the planters with bumbo, which was a type of rum. And you have to admit, half a gallon of rum sounds better than 50 emails pleading with you to vote. Amen. And oh, the man, that's century, true. Alcohol production went way up and consumption followed suit. This also meant that regular Joes and Janes could get their drink on, and that made America's elites sort of nervous. And by the mid-19th century, more people could drink and more people could vote, often at the same time. And drinking on election day occasionally led to violence, like the famous incident in 1882 when three McCoys stabbed Ellison Hatfield That's the one times. I was referring to earlier. I, that's cool that he's mentioning that. And then shot him to death. I guess they were really bad at stabbing. But William Devil Ants Hatfield organized a posse and caught up to the McCoys yep. on their way to that's the That's Devil Ants right there in the picture. William Devil Ants Hatfield organized a posse. That's Devil Ants down there. It's played by uh, Kevin Costner in the series. Fantastic series. My cousin Boyd Holbrook's in that one. Um, definitely worth checking out. 
Ossie and caught up to the McCoys on their way to the Pikefield Jail, where he kidnapped them, tied them to some pawpaw yep. bushes, and shot them dead. And this all fed into the temperance movement, which eventually led to Prohibition. But when Prohibition was repealed, states continued to regulate the most serious problems created by alcohol. And this is how we got age requirements, Sunday bar closings, and tighter regulations on when and where alcohol was sold. The biggest perceived problem with alcohol on Election Day was that- it's not a very flattering picture of John Kerry, is it? to public drunkenness and bribery of voters. And it took decades for the state to finally repeal the election day drinking laws with South Carolina once again coming in last. The state didn't repeal its ban until 2014. However, candidates still can't promise individual voters liquor in exchange for votes because that's just common sense. Bribery, for example, in 2013, yeah. Arkansas state Democrat Hudson Hollum pleaded guilty to election fraud after he and several other men identified absentee voters, contacted voters directly with offers, and then collected the ballots. Hallam admitted that he bought the votes with things like chicken dinners and alcohol. And according to the DOJ, Hallam told his associate, quote, we need to use that black limo and buy a couple of cases of some cheap vodka and whiskey to get people to vote. Two days later, Hallam's cronies, quote, spoke with an individual in Memphis, Tennessee about getting a discounted price for the purchase of 100 half pints of vodka for the campaign. Now I can see a situation where somebody might be ignorant enough not to know that it's illegal to do something like that. Not sure that somebody who doesn't know that's wrong is somebody I'd want to win an election anyway. Now, Hallam won his special election with 394 votes, strikingly similar to the 391 votes that Washington got back in 1758. But whereas George became America's first president, Hallam got three years of probation and nine months of home confinement. Fortunately, this long-standing American tradition is still respected and embraced in our nation's future. Animal house. Of course, if you're gonna get trashed to vote this year, you should really sober up with a delicious home-cooked meal, which you can do with today's sponsor, HelloFresh. Hello Fresh is good stuff. I've used them before. So we'll go ahead and wrap it up right there. Looks like he's uh, finished up with everything. What do you think should be on this list? What are some things that used to be illegal in America that you think uh, took way too long to make them legal or things that are still illegal? I mean, you know, a hundred years from now, people will be talking about how marijuana was once illegal in the United States. You know, most, I don't know how many states it is now. Here in Ohio, we just legalize recreational use of it, but uh, it's becoming more and more common where it wasn't so long ago. Sports betting was illegal here in Ohio until a couple of years ago. Those kinds of things that have changed just in the last few years that down the road, somebody will make a video and say, can you believe this was once illegal? So what do you think should be on the list? Let me know in the comment section below and uh, we'll see you again soon with another video. Thanks for watching.